Sympathy is the capacity we have to tap into someone else's feelings or feel with them or feel what they feel. Now what are the basic elements of an act of sympathizing? And here I want to suggest that we can answer this question by turning to the philosophy of perception. So comparing our capacity for sympathy with perception brings out how it's all too easy to overlook viable options. I will highlight how much recent work tacitly rules out direct or immediate accounts of sympathy, accounts that view sympathizing as feeling the actual feelings of others. So here's what I'll do. After setting out the background for understanding sympathy, I will apply a general framework for thinking about perception to our understanding of sympathy. And that's the core of the project. So I'll suggest on the basis of this that it's a modern conception of psychology that fosters this rejection of naive accounts of sympathy. And as I'll bring out, such a conception also underpins recent ethical worries about sympathy. So if I'm right, then it's worthwhile to re-examine our basic commitments about what it is to sympathize with someone else. Now what I call sympathy is often called empathy. The labeling doesn't really matter. What matters is that by sympathy, I don't mean a specific kind of compassionate sentiment, but a general psychological capacity we seem to have. The capacity to live through the mental states of other people, whatever these states happen to be. So sympathy can be understood as a kind of openness to the mental lives of others. Now, understanding the history of the concept of sympathy sheds important light on current debates. So, the concept of sympathy, at least in philosophy and science, became first important in Stoic philosophy. So back then it wasn't a psychological notion as it is now. It was a concept in physics and cosmology. So philosophers introduced it to explain cases of action at a distance. Think of the way the moon influences the tidal flow of our oceans. It can do so without any contact between the lunar surface and the sea. And that's puzzling. The Stoics inferred that the cosmos must be a sympathetic unity, that any of its parts can affect every other part without intermediaries. Now, to modern ears, this idea of action at a distance will sound funny. Modern physics seeks explanations that are different. It seeks explanations that trace proximal causes, vibrating air, molecular chain reactions, propagating light waves, something like that. But it doesn't take away that even today philosophy has room for the concept of sympathy. Although it's discredited in the natural sciences, sympathy has lived on in the moral sphere. And this is mainly due to the work of English and Scottish Enlightenment authors, for whom the problem of action at a distance seemed to re-emerge. We somehow feel affected by other minds. How can my impressions inform me about the ideas of other people? And sympathy gets introduced to explain this, and so molds into the psychological shape we're familiar with. And this is how I will understand the concept in what follows as well. To sympathize with someone is to feel your way into their mental state. And it's often taken to be a crucial element in mind reading. So often an answer to how Zainab knows what Hisham is going through, if she knows it, is that Zainab sympathizes with Hisham's feelings. So sympathy often is a source of knowledge about others. Now, sense perception is a source of knowledge too. It's a form of awareness of our surroundings. But significantly, this awareness is experiential. So perceiving a suspension bridge, for instance, means that you experience that bridge. And I think that similarly, we can understand sympathy as a kind of experiential awareness. It is commonly contrasted with an inferential or theoretical understanding of other people's states. So we can think of sympathy as a source of non-inferential knowledge about others because sympathizing with someone else is an experience. Now I want to illuminate sympathetic awareness by comparing it to perceptual awareness. And this is because in the philosophy of perception we find this rather clear delineation of so take this suspension bridge again. When you see that bridge, what elements make up such an act of seeing? And in the philosophy of perception, 
two important questions can be asked here. So when you see that bridge, is the bridge the immediate object of your visual awareness, or is it something else, such as an image of the bridge, or the bridge is outer surface, or a bridge-like sense impression that I have? And this question has a long and infamous history and concerns the immediate object of perceptual awareness. Now, the second question concerns the kind of awareness we have of this immediate object of perception. Whether it's a bridge or a sense impression, we can ask, must these immediate objects of perceptual awareness exist or not? So could you have this awareness if the thing you became aware of didn't exist? Is it a form of contact with reality, or is it different? And these answers to these questions are currently still debated. So both questions are controversial, but at least the basic distinctions seem to me straightforward. So let me say a little bit more about each of these distinctions. So first we have immediate and immediate perceptual awareness. Think of a painted portrait of your cousin. Your awareness of the portrait enables you to see a person who isn't immediately visible in your surroundings. The portrait functions as a mediator in your perception. It enables you to see a relative even though that relative isn't around. Now, ordinary seeing doesn't involve awareness of paintings, of course, but many philosophers have suggested that it does involve awareness of some other kind of mediator. So Hume, for instance, claims that seeing a suspension bridge is a visual awareness of a private complex of visual impressions, impressions that enable you to see a bridge. So when asking about the immediate objects of visual awareness and perception, what they are, we run into this issue of perceptual mediation. Is our perception of the world mediated or not? Now, secondly, dependent and independent perception. Is our awareness dependent on its immediate objects, such as bridges or cousins? So suppose someone is hallucinating. They report seeing a figure in the corner of the room, but there happens to be no such figure. Can they still perceive that figure? Now, and here some people say that, yeah, they can, and other people deny that. And their dispute is over the kind of awareness that constitutes perceiving. So either this awareness is dependent on its objects, or it's merely intentional. And this distinction is central, especially in recent discussions of perception. So these distinctions give us four different ways of thinking about what perception involves. And I'll continue focusing on vision and discussing the options here. So first, naive realism. This echoes common sense. It's the view that we are immediately aware of what we purport to perceive, and that such awareness cannot occur if there is in fact nothing there. An intentionalist agrees that we are immediately aware of what we purport to perceive, but maintains that this awareness may occur regardless of whether its object exists or not. It's intentional. And the third view is best known through its defense by sense datum theories, which were popular at least until the 1950s. So contrary to naive realism and intentionalism, sense datum theory maintains that perception is awareness of a mediator or a proxy that relays information about the objects in our environment we report to see. And the fourth option is a bit puzzling. So it holds that perception requires mediators, just as the sense datum theory, but claims that our awareness of them may occur regardless of their existence, and it's unclear what could motivate this view. Let's now return to sympathy. So I suggested that sympathy is a kind of experiential awareness. So in paradigm cases, it's a source of knowledge about others' feelings because of some kind of experience. It relies on an experience that we report as feeling what someone else is feeling. So consider an example. Hisham is in panic because he's being chased by a wild dog. Zainab has a sympathetic reaction to Hisham's suffering. She watches and hears Hisham and feels along with his anxiety. She's affected by his feeling. So here Zainab becomes aware of a specific feeling that enables her to know that Hisham is in a state of terror. 
Now, applying the two earlier distinctions from the philosophy of perception can help clarify Zainab's sympathetic response. Is her awareness mediated or not? Does it depend on the actual occurrence of what she feels or not? And answers to these questions carve out, again, four general theories, but now theories of sympathy. So these are the options. Either sympathizing with another person's feeling is immediate, or there is some mediator involved. And either sympathizing with another involves a merely intentional mode of awareness, or it does not. So these systematic options invite some further observations. So take Alvin Goldman. He writes about sympathy that it is a low-level mental simulation in which one mental process is launched in an attempt to match another one. So in recognizing another face as expressing a certain emotion, the observer's emotional system somehow resonates with that of the target. And this is the matching event on which the attribution is based. And similarly, Emily Copeland maintains that sympathizing has the observer replicate or reconstruct the target's experiences. And these are experiences not directly accessible. Now, it strikes me that the vast majority of recent authors follows this idea. They seem to assume that Zainab's own feeling mediates her sympathy for Hisham. So when Zainab sympathizes with Hisham, the feeling she is immediately aware of is something like an image of Hisham's anxiety. Sympathizing is a kind of copying of feeling, where these copies are either low-level automatic responses or involve a more sophisticated mechanism mental simulation or imagination. So, in short, authors seem to understand sympathy either as a form of emotional contagion, its low level, or as a form of mental simulation, its higher level. So that sympathy is mediated awareness seems just beyond dispute. But this ignores two of the four available options we see, those that parallel naive realism and intentionalism in the philosophy of perception. So we should at least consider these. Suppose that Hisham's anxiety is the immediate object of Zainab's awareness. So what Zainab feels is Hisham's fear. Here, sympathy doesn't require her to have any feeling of her own. So whether Zainab's awareness of Hisham's fear is merely intentional or not, we can set that aside. On this line of thinking, at least, the view of sympathy as a capacity to feel what others feel is just spot on. And the disappearance of positions like this from the discussion is a recent one. So Stoic authors introduced sympathy to allow for one thing immediately influencing another. And at la as late as 1928, Alfred North Whitehead characterized sympathy as feeling the feeling in another and feeling conformally with another. So here Whitehead as well explicitly allowed for feeling to be shared between individuals in a way that's immediate and dependent on the existence of such feelings. So why does the idea of feeling what another feels sound so old to many contemporary ears? And here I suggest that it does because it contradicts a modern intuition about psychology. So it's a commonplace that feelings are essentially subjective, private states of mind, only accessible to the person in whom they originate. This holds for mental states generally, especially where they involve affect or some other kind of emotional component. Should we accept this? And I think that the intuition conflicts, actually, with the phenomena that led human others to revive this ancient theory of sympathy. So if we read the treatise, we see Hume struggle to admit the manifestly social form that human feeling can take. So as he writes, no quality of human nature is more remarkable, both in itself and in its consequences, than that propensity we have to sympathize with others and to receive by communication their inclinations and sentiments, however different from or even contrary to our own. A human later tries to harmonize such sympathetic responses with his own general assumption about the mind, his assumption that our consciousness strictly doesn't reach beyond the affections of our own minds. Now Hume's theory of sympathy seems to lie at the root of current discussions still. 
But just as most philosophers of perception have come to reject or at least be suspicious of Hume's immediate theory of sense perception in terms of impressions, perhaps we should shun the narrowness of Hume's theory of sympathy as well. So I think that at least this reveals a tension. On the one hand, we feel the pull of these everyday cases in which the suffering of others is communicated to us effectively. On the other hand, a psychological theorizing just doesn't admit feeling to travel beyond the individual. But what makes us so confident that we cannot share feelings? I think we should move beyond our comfort zone here and assess our assumptions about feelings, assumptions about other minds. Because I think that the 18th century needn't settle things once and for all. Now this tension between everyday theoretical convictions also has implications for the ethics of sympathy. Some recent authors have worried about sympathy's reliability. So does it track what it purports to track? And can it ever succeed? So let's look at Peter Goldie, who's a prominent critic here. So he spells out sympathy in terms of an Im imaginative perspective taking. He thinks that when Zainab sympathizes with Hisham, she imagines being Hisham. And in such an imaginative project, Zainab becomes aware of imagined feelings she then assigns to Hisham. So strictly, Zainab isn't aware of Hisham's feelings immediately. She's aware of an imagined counterpart, a mediator. So Goldie concludes on the basis of this that sympathy must distort, because there's always going to be some factor left out of such imaginative engagement. Trying to apprehend one feeling by apprehending a recreated, similar, but still different one will necessarily fall short. But if sympathy gave immediate awareness of another person's state, then Goldie's worry just wouldn't arise. Of course, then it may still be difficult to exercise a capacity for sympathy, just as it can be hard to exercise a capacity for, say, sight. So seeing some farm animals on a dim-lit country road may be far from easy. But the point is that if sympathy is a capacity for feeling someone else's feelings immediately, then it must at least be possible to succeed in doing so. And this is why the earlier discussion of sympathy matters. So if sympathy were always mediated by some feelings originated in us, then Gaulley's concerns would arise. But if not, then sympathizing might just be an invaluable way of relating to others. Now this is just the starting point of a discussion. Although historically all four possible theories of sympathy received attention, I just worry that nowadays philosophers start ordering their meals without even having flipped the menu. So the analogy with perception is helpful. I've tried to use it to bring out some further options, possibilities. More specifically, I suggested that we may want to take seriously this understanding of sympathy as immediate, as an immediate form of awareness of the feelings of others, especially in light of those cases where feelings do seem to be shared. Now, I haven't defended that theory. My main point is just that systematically assessing the full range of options just forces us to think again.